this is Mike Graham, your host for Championship Wrestling from Florida, and uh, we got a great DVD for you here. I mean, you're going to see some stuff that's really, really cool. The first match out of the box is the Sheep Herders, who later became the Bushwhackers, wrestling against the Cuban Connection, which is Dave Sierra and Ricky Santana, both from wrestling families, both tough competitors, and. I don't want to say this to offend anyone, or sometimes people are touchy, but the blood that's in this match could not be put on television today. It is a, it's a bloodbath, it's a brutal battle, and uh, the sheep herders have been known for years for their, their tough ability, fight to the end. Uh, they had a great career with the WWF, and uh, both of them live here in Florida. As a matter of fact, the sheep herders and, and Dave Sierra are all here in Florida. Ricky Santana, I believe, is now in Puerto Rico, but they all had great careers, and you're going to see them at their peak right now. Let's go to the Sheep Herders against the Cuban Connection. In the background, you're picking up the chants of USA. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the Sheep Herders in the ring with their flag bearer, Johnny Ace. We have an interesting BTR of Johnny Ace. Um, let's take a look at it right now before we start this match. Surrounded by beautiful women. Thanks to the Sheep Herders, I'm on top of the wrestling world. I'm the topic of wrestling conversation, and Johnny Ace is your household name. Now, guys of Florida, I know you're wondering why your women are so mesmerized by me, why they're taken by me, why they love and lust after me. I'll tell you why. For the first time in their life, they see a real man. That's right, Johnny Ace is a real man, and it took me to come from California to satisfy the wants, needs, and desires of your women. That must make you feel pretty good, doesn't it? But don't worry about it, I enjoy it. And girls, don't compare your boys to me. That's like comparing hamburger to steak. I'm in a class all by myself. If you think Florida's hot, Johnny Ace is. I am hot. Back into your ring now is tag team title match. With us is Johnny Ace standing on the outside. This Florida tag team title match is a one ball, 60 minute time limit putting against the Sheep Herders, the Cuban Connection. This is an unusual situation, ladies and gentlemen, but it is a title match, and it will go the full hour if need be. The titles are definitely on the line. The Chant USA has been picked up by the fans here. It's a hot August night here, and we're off to a wild start here on Florida Championship Wrestling. Flag ceremony in effect right now as the Sheep Herders hold their flag up. An interesting video by Johnny Ace. I really didn't catch much of the drift of it, but I enjoyed everybody in it except for Johnny Ace. Looks like we have young Ricky Santana of the Cuban Connection starting out against Butch Miller. Tomorrow night in Orlando at the Eddie Graham Sports Complex, there will also be wrestling held. of these teams usually have unusual tactics when they're in the ring. They don't always stick to the rules, but they are definitely competitors. Both of them have been tag team champions and know the taste of winning. A little bit more of a feeling out situation right here. Locking up, trying to gain the position. Referee Bill Alfonso definitely has his hands full in a tag team situation. I'd like to say a special hello to my friend Sergeant Larry Siegel of the Police Athletic League who's here with us tonight. Also Manny Fumes, head of the Just Say No to Drugs program. Luke Miller in the ring now against Ricky Santana. Definitely has the advantage. Trying to slow Santana down. The Sheep Herders would love to get a quick victory here tonight. But I believe the Cuban Connection has a different opinion. I'd like to remind all of you kids watching Championship Wrestling from Florida that we do say, just say no to drugs if you're listening, kids, please, for us. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we're going to have to go to a commercial, so let's check the commercial out, go check our sponsor, and we'll get back. If there happens to be a pet ball during this, we'll come back on instant replay to it. Ladies and gentlemen, while we're out at a break, we 
Cuban connection has definitely taken the worst of this match. Both of them now are bleeding profusely. Sheep is more of a veteran team, been together quite a bit longer. The world travelers have definitely taken the advantage, but the Cuban connection is still fighting. They're still on their feet. Ricky Santana fighting fire back, trying to get a good grip, but stopped again. Bill Alfonso totally lost control of the whole match. It's hard to maintain control of the matches and especially in a situation where you've got this many men to cover and a watch. One of the Cuban connection hurling, one of the sheep putters on the outside. We've got all four men on the floor now. Pass them into the wall. This is totally out of control. Johnny Ace flag bearer using the flag, trying to stop the Cuban connection. One of the Cubans picks up the chair. The other Cuban picks up the same chair. Hitting Luke Miller right between the eyes. Definitely ringing his bell. Luke Miller down on the floor. Butch Miller inside. This would be a perfect opportunity for one of the Cubans to pick up the pinball, take over that floor tag team title. The title is definitely on the line here. Mass confusion now. One of the sheep herders holding Cuban connection. They're working on him. Cubans takes care of Johnny Ace out on the floor, grabbing the flagpole. Now entering back into the ring with the, actually with the Sheep Herders flag. Sheep Herders backing away. And it looks like the Cuban connection is taking off with the flag. The match is stopped. The bell's been rang. Let's wait for the decision from the referee. The Cuban connection leaving the area with the flag. Johnny Ace without his flagpole, trying to explain trying to get a decision right now from the referee. Obviously, Bill Alfonso confused, having four or five men in it. Ladies and gentlemen, apparently we're not going to be able to get a, a definite opinion until a few minutes. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's go ahead and go to a commercial, and I'll try to get Bill Alfonso over here and get what he considers the outcome of this match. Welcome back, and like I said, man, that was, that was a bloodbath, and uh, back in the 70s, that match, as a matter of fact, was from 1987, and uh, you're going to see another match now from 1987 when Championship Wrestling from Florida merged with Jim Crockett Promotions, and it's uh, Terry Funk, the infamous Terry Funk, against Mike Rotundo, and in this match, you're going to see some involvement with Kevin Sullivan and Dory Funk Jr., and since then, you've seen bathroom brawls or whatever, but you're going to see the first of Terry Funk being a plumber. And when you watch this, you'll know what I'm talking about. Dusty Rhodes is the son of a plumber, but you'll see Terry Funk with some plumbing accessories around his head. So right now, let's go to Terry Funk and Mike Rotundo. Welcome back to Championship Wrestling from Florida, and I'm your anchor man, Steve Kern. You know, the Funk Brothers need no introduction to professional wrestling or to professional wrestling fans. They've been around for quite a while. They're second generation wrestlers. Their, their father, Dory Funk Sr., dug out a name for himself in the Texas area, and the brothers and the sons took over and fulfilled that name. They've dominated the South, they've dominated the West, and now they're back in the state of Florida together as brothers. We've got a special VTR we'd like to show you from the Funk Brothers, and they've got some comments. So if, with the help of my cameraman right now, if we could possibly see that VTR, 
Let's watch Dory Funk Jr. and Terry Funk. You know, I'm sure being the wrestling fans that you are, you are well aware of the NWA, the largest wrestling conglomerate in wrestling today with over 220 syndicated stations. And I'm sure you're also familiar with the AWA and the WWF. These are all multi-million dollar organizations. But yet, there is a new one on the sunrise, on the sunrise in Florida, and do you know what that organization is? That is the F, F, and F. Funk, Funk, and Florida. Believe me, the Funk brothers have come to Florida and now we don't have millions of dollars. We don't have money to throw around. We don't have 220 syndicated stations. But what are we? We are individuals and we are the best athletes in professional wrestling today. Now, aren't you Haitians? Aren't you Cubans? Aren't you crackers so fortunate to have the Funk brothers around? Tor Dory and Terry Funk. Now, what has happened to Black Jack Mulligan? Well, he's become what he once be was before. He is a chicken plucking chicken back in Sweetwater, Texas, because he realized that if he stayed around the state of Florida, that he wouldn't be able to compete, to be on the main events, because he is a lesser caliber wrestler than what the funks are. He is not a has-been. I hate to inform you people that, that the old prune-faced, wrinkled-up Black Jack Mulligan is what I have always said he was, is a never was. Now, we have got Mike Rotundo. Oh, Mike, aren't you so pretty? Aren't you so handsome? Look in yourself in the mirror, and there is a last time that you will ever get to see yourself looking like that because we have got the money up. The dollars, the silver dollars, money on the line that you will be putting out of wrestling. Now let's get down to Kevin Sullivan. Is this all that you have left is Kevin Sullivan? And he's crying that he has not Black Jack Mulligan anymore. Well, he's begging for the American dream. Don't you realize Dusty Rhodes will not come in here and help you, Sullivan? Do you know why? Because he is nothing more than an overbearing, obnoxious, putrid, egg-sucking dog that wouldn't come in here and take a chance because he's yellow like his hair. He won't take a chance being your partner, Sullivan. No, he wouldn't take a chance with the Funks with a Sherman tank. He wouldn't take a chance with the Funks with a battleship. He would not take a chance with the Funks in the ring with Ollie North. And neither would Ollie North take a chance in getting in the ring with my brother here on myself. Well, Terry, I just want to promise everybody that this Florida heavyweight championship belt, mm -hmm. which is what we came to the state of Florida for, is going to stay around my waist. I Here's don't care the what the NWA says. Here's I don't waist. care what championship wrestling from Florida says. The commission, and the only way anybody's going to take this belt away from me is to pin my shoulders to the mat for a three count, and that challenge is open to Mike Rotundo. That's my bubba. Welcome back to Championship Wrestling from Florida. We've got Terry Funk in the ring. A match is scheduled. Terry Funk against young Tim Horner. Right now, we're awaiting the arrival of Tim Horner. Terry Funk obviously in the ring, arguing with the referee, wanting to know where his opponent is. Tim Horner from Alabama, scheduled to wrestle tonight against Terry Funk Jr. Mike Rotundo has just come on the TV set. 
Tim Hortons play is late, but don't worry about it. Oh, interesting change of events for my first opportunity out here. Tim Horner's plane is apparently late and will not make it, and now Mike Cutano's decided to take his place. Terry Funk wanting nothing to do with this, arguing with the referee. Mike Cutano looking for an obvious opportunity to get back at the Funk dynasty. That's the body slam. It's going to take Terry Funk definitely by surprise. Terry Funk not even fully out of his wrestling attire. Rolls out, rolls out, looking for an opportunity for a breather. Mike Rotunda right now, and obviously in a dispute over the Florida title match. Held with him and Dory Funk Jr., Terry's older brother. Dory Funk Jr. claims to be the Florida title holder right as of now. And is in possession of the belt. Terry having a little trouble removing his clothing here. Seems to have his own wrestling match going on right now with his equipment. Please, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to bear with me. This is the first opportunity for me to do this, and if I make mistakes, I'm sure it'll give you something to have an opportunity to laugh at. Mike Rotunda taking Terry Funk, throwing him out of the ring. Remember wrestling fans, Sarasota, Robarts Arena, tonight, big card, plenty of wrestling matches, plenty of excitement. Mike Rotunda not satisfied for waiting in the ring, goes right after his opponent on the floor. Back into the ring now, the referee is Bella Alfonso. Terry Funk, back out on the floor. This is going to be a wild match, I'm sure, to start off on that tonight. For wrestling. Terry Funk grappling with the wrestlers. Terry Funk obviously confused now and days. Had no idea he was going to be wrestling tonight, Michael Tunda. Looking forward to wrestling Tim Horner, I'm sure. Michael Tunda arm wrestling Terry Funk, the opposite turnbuckle. And again. Tunda definitely looking to take an advantage on Terry Funk. Shoots him in. Reversal. Now ah, Terry Funk trying to take the upper hand. Punch him to the forehead. Joel Alfonso needs to step in right here to get him off of the rope. Mike Rotundo down in the corner. Looking for an opportunity to get back out. Now, Mike Rotundo out onto the floor, and Terry Funk following him out. It's a hot August night here, Tampa, Florida. Terry Funk versus Mike Rotundo. Mike Rotundo, the holder of the Florida heavyweight title, but not in possession of the belt as of now. Terry Funk bringing Mike Rotundo back into the ring, slamming his head into a turnbuckle again. The Tundo box reverses it, slamming Funk's head in. And again, this gives the Tundo breather. Now he's working on Terry Funk. Again and again into the corner. Funk days. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd say it had to be over 100 degrees in this studio tonight. Crowd picking up the champ. Terry Funk, delirious, out on his feet an opportunity for Mike Rotundo to take into this airplane spin. Mike Rotundo uses this hole quite a bit. Dizzily dumping Terry Funk. Now, Dory Funk Jr. entering the ring. Can you some help out here, ladies and gentlemen? Pounding on Mike Rotundo. Mike Rotundo, the Florida champion. And then comes Kevin Sullivan. Kevin Sullivan hooking Terry Funk's leg. Mike Rotunda firing back at Dory Funk Jr. It's really cut loose already. Right here, right? Kevin Sullivan firing on Terry Funk. Ramming his head into the wooden door. Open hand and slapping him in the chest. Mike Rotunda firing on Dory Funk Jr. Dory Funk Jr. is lost. Dead. Looks like Mike Rotunda has opened the cut over Dory Funk Jr.'s eye. Roy Funk Jr. opened up. 
out into the crowd with Rotundo hot on his heels. Mike Rotundo, destined to get back the belt that he rightfully claims as the Florida champion. Kevin Sullivan and Terry Funk fighting all over the studio. We lost track of him. It looks like Terry Funk has got part of the bathroom around his neck. I believe he's wearing some of it. Kevin Sullivan, Mike Rotundo, obviously looking to make a reputation of against the Fox. All four wrestlers in the ring at this time. The Funk's looking for an exit. Kevin Sullivan, Mike Rotundo, still in the ring. Ushers for people to come back. Ladies and gentlemen, we're looking right now at two men determined to take care of the Funk Brothers. Let's pause right now for a commercial break, and we'll get back to this action right after this word from our sponsor. Thank you. Well, I think everybody can understand now when I talked about Terry being one of the first plumbers in the wrestling business. The toilet seat over his head was a bit too much, but when you got Kevin Sullivan, Terry Funk, Dory Funk, and Mike Rotundo all in the ring together, there was never any telling what was going to take place. I used to just cringe cross my fingers that they weren't going to do something we kicked off the air for because they were completely wild and out of control like they still are today. But in this next segment, you're going to see some guys, Lex Luger, Ron Simmons, and Kendall Windham, and they're wrestling against Bad News Allen, Bruiser Brody, and Dave Sierra, the Cuban assassin. This is a very violent six-man tag match, and you're going to see how Bad News Allen and Brody take it upon themselves to try to hurt Luger. And then in the next matches on the show, you're going to see what Luger did to retaliate and how the whole story lays out. We've taken a, a three-month program and condensed it into one video on demand, one DVD, just for y'all to watch. So right now, let's go to a classic six-man tag match with names like you've never heard before. Right now, though, I might just uh, preface the Southern Heavyweight Championship match upcoming by saying let's take a look at the last time uh, that Lex Luger uh, and Bad News Allen collided and uh, well you'll see uh, how bad the blood is between these two men. Both men are reeling back to their feet. Tag is made, Ron Simmons comes charging in, Kendall Windham. Hurling off the uh, ring apron and it is Ron Simmons really exploding now. Cuban assassin. Wait a minute. Here comes Bad News Allen, and now Lex Luger is fixing it up. Now it's Bruiser Brody tangling with him. Well, it looks like the referee is kind of at odds in. He doesn't know where to start counting, who to count out. It gets such a mixed up mess, and there are times you don't know who the legal man is in the ring. And there's Bruiser Brody picking up Ron Simmons, dropping him over that top rope. Lex Luger hurtled out through the middle rope. Can to win him out on the floor. Looks like the match is going out to the floor now. Well, it has indeed. And you can see those boots being delivered by uh, Pat News Allen. And uh, meanwhile, we've got a, 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 we had a pinfall in the ring. We had a pinfall in the ring, but look at this. Pat News Allen and Bruiser Brody double teaming on Lex Luger outside the ring. So they're strictly after the bounty. Well, there you have it, extremely bad blood between this man, Bad News Allen, and the Rookie of the Year as named by Pro Wrestling Illustrated and you, the wrestling fans who named him that, Lex Luger, the Southern Heavyweight Champion. So that's coming up. One fall, one hour, the Southern Heavyweight Championship comes on the line right after we pause for these words. Waiting now for the introductions to be made for this Southern Heavyweight Championship match. The two principals are into the ring. Accompanied to the back the ring by his mentor, so Oliver of a hump eight, the challenger. From Harlem, New York, 258 pounds, Bad News Allen. Weighing in at 275 pounds from Chicago, Illinois, the Southern Heavyweight Wrestling Champion, 
Lex Luger. Lex Luger putting the title on the line. Got to say one thing about the man. He puts his money where his mouth is. He uh, doesn't like bad news, Alan. There's bad blood between them. And Luger not wasting any time whatsoever. He has gone beyond the scope of uh, titles here. He's tired of the challenges. He's tired of the bounties being put out by uh, Sir Oliver Humperdinck and has decided to uh, fight fire with fire, go after it. Launch a hefty offense immediately and uh, Buddy, he looks like he's got things going. He took bad news, Allen, by surprise. You know, Gordon, I kind of think that maybe Lex Luger is finally finding out what professional wrestling is all about. This is not a game for kids. This is out for keeps. And if you can get a man from the rear and soften him up, slow him up, when something as important as the Southern title and $25,000 bounty money is at stake, you take advantage of any and every opportunity that you can because you may rest assured that Bad News Allen is going to do just that. And I tell you, right now, I believe these two men are pretty evenly matched, but I will have to perhaps give the edge to Bad News Allen. This man is experienced. He has Sir Oliver Humperdinck at ringside as his mentor. And Bad News Allen will stop at absolutely nothing to win a match. Bad News Allen, a chop into the throat of uh, Lex Luger. And the Southern Heavyweight Champion bent backwards over the ropes. Has got a handful of problems here. A referee, Bill Alfonso, watching carefully. Allen catches him once again. A forearm in between the shoulder blades and smashes Lex Luger into the turnbuckle. Luger is down. Luger's got some problems. Well, you know, watching Bad News Allen, the man is very methodical. He considers himself the ultimate warrior. And you know, after watching some of these Rambo movies, I think uh, Bad News Allen could teach Rambo a lot. And uh, martial arts, the arts of self-defense. Right now with Lex Luger on the floor, looks like Bad News Allen's going for a chair right here in front of me. And he looks like, well, yep, he brought it right down across the shoulders and back of Lex Luger. Lex Luger is groveling on the floor. This man is in pain. This match could be over almost before it began. Bad News Allen is going to make an example out of Lex Luger. Well, he's certainly trying to, and the uh, interesting aspect here is both men are outside the ring. And it is uh, Bad News Allen smashing him right into the table next to Buddy Colt. And now Luger is firing back. That's what I said. I think Lex Luger has finally realized what wrestling is all about, the professional rankings. He grabbed that, he grabbed that board there from the television cameras. He wrapped around Bad News Allen's neck all over the floor now, and Lex Luger is really piling it on to Bad News Allen. So the battle rages outside the ring. And as I said, this transcends, really, the Southern title. This is strictly uh, each man seeking vengeance on the other. And it's Bad News Allen turning the tables on Lex Luger. Well, I'll tell you, this here is anything but a wrestling match. It is a brawl at its worst. These men have completely forgotten all about wrestling. The referees cannot restore order in the ring. He doesn't want to stop the match. There's a lot riding on this match now. Luger smashed into that turnbuckle and driven back to the canvas once again. And uh, the crowd really on Luger's side here. And they're uh, hurtling all sorts of comments to uh, Bad News Allen. Luger in trouble. Luger in more trouble, I think, than I've ever seen him in a match before against a single opponent. We know Gordon, Bad News Allen, no doubt, one of the roughest opponents anywhere in the wrestling world. And uh, with Sir Oliver Humperdinck, God, what he just did, He's going to make sure that his man has every opportunity to win that match, and he will help Bad News Allen any time he gets a chance. Luger fired back. Luger catches him in the midsection. Luger catches him once again. Bad News Allen rips across the eyes of Alex Luger. Well, one thing I can tell you, neither of these men are a quitter in any respect of words. Both men will fight right to the very end. Both men must be masochistic. They, they can't feel any pain. Their adrenaline's up. They're fighting as hard as they can. Just right back and forth. Looks like right now, Lex Luger's in a lot of trouble. Oh. 
Luger barely rolling out of the way just in the nick of time. And so bad news, Allen hitting that, uh, hitting that ring mat full force. And he was counting on the body of Lex Luger to be down there underneath him to take the brunt of that. Instead, he found the hard canvas. And you can hear the crowd picking up the chant now, Luger, Luger, Luger. And Pat News Allen catches it coming in as Lex Luger connects. And Luger, a picture of grim determination. Moving in against him once again. High hit toss by Lex Luger. And Luger. Luger now. And he is really pumped up. He connected with one that came in from the backyard. He catches him once again. The back of the elbow has bad news. That will challenge it out. He catches Sir Oliver Humperdinck. We see right there, Lex Luger made a mistake. He turned his back on Bad News Allen, and it, it could have happened where Bad News would have got the advantage up there. Atomic knee drop by Lex Luger. Luger moving in on Bad News Allen once again. Irish whip. That time he reversed the trend a little bit. He got a three count. He got a three count. He got a three count. We could see it very plainly. Those feet were on the ropes, but the referee did not see it. The referee could not see it. I told everybody he was going to have to put a I told everybody it was a matter of time. The third ultimate warrior would defeat Lex Luger. And now, your new Southern Heavyweight Champion. There you have it, Bad News Allen leaving. Lex Luger can't believe what happened to him, but it did, and it did indeed. Lex Luger dethroned. Here you can see it once again. The referee, you can see, was concentrating on those shoulders, did not see those feet go up, and Allen very quickly pulled them back in. Luger knows there's something terribly amiss here, but there's not much that can be done about it at this point in time. A decision by the referee, and so for the moment, we have a new Southern Heavyweight Champion in Bad News Allen. Stand by with our standby matches. We'll be back in just a moment. Along with some incredible wrestling matches and incredible wrestlers, you're going to learn the history of, of wrestling and different things that took place that, that wrestling fans have never been privy to before. Uh, my dad basically came to Florida in 1959, 1960. Uh, Cowboy Luttrell was a wrestling promoter here. They only ran in the summer. It was like a carnival. They had a lot of girl wrestlers and midget wrestlers, and it was ran half-heartedly. And, and Cowboy was was you know older and didn't have the time and energy to put into it. But Dad, who had been a, a superstar with he and his brother Jerry Graham in New York, knew the potential, knew what was going on. When Dad started this company in Florida in the early '60s, he realized he needed partners and and other great wrestlers and Duke Kiyomuka was a huge star in Houston, Texas when Dad was just starting and Dad and, and Duke formed this relationship and bond. And of course Duke had ties to Japan. Uh, wrestling in Florida is probably one of the largest factors and largest inputs into wrestling in Japan in history because of Duke and my father's business connection. Hiro Matsuda was brought to the United States back in the early 60s from Duke Kiyomuka. Duke worked with the wrestling promotion. My dad went over and wrestled in Japan in the 60s when American wrestlers had really never gone over there. He was one of the starters of American wrestling going to Japan. But anyway, the Florida-Japan connection was then made. And Hiro Matsuda, Saito, Ninja, all of the great wrestlers from Japan all came to Florida trained, worked out, and learned how to wrestle with Hiro Matsuda right in the office here in Florida. And you're getting ready to watch a match. A guy that wrestled is the Ninja, who is now the great Muta, which every wrestling fan out there knows who Muta is. Well, he started 
right here in Florida as Ninja, and you're going to see one of his first matches. And he's the first guy that ever did a moonsault off the top rope. And he's wrestling against Prince Akea, whose father was a professional wrestler, King Curtis Akea, who's still in Hawaii. I hope he's watching the show because I have nothing but good things to say about King Curtis and his son, the Prince. Great people. Uh, they're just, they're having a good time in life. They're both retired, they're both successful. And if they're watching this, hello from Florida. It's as close as I can get to Hawaii, but I am gonna come visit you. So you're gonna see wrestling history set right here with a ninja who is the fabulous Muta wrestling Prince Akea, who's the son of King Curtis. So let's get to it. And that promises to be a very exciting match too. We're gonna be seeing our first appearance here on television of the ninja. And speaking of the ninja, I want to take a couple of moments now to talk to a gentleman who is internationally known for his martial arts skills. I'm referring, of course, to Ron Slinker. And Ron, uh, I wonder if you'd mind uh, explaining to the people just exactly uh, what is a ninja. All right, Gordon, I, I don't mind doing that. First of all, I'd like to say I've, uh, I've been traveling throughout exactly where, I don't know, but uh, I've been wrestling here about all over the country. And I'm back here for how long, I don't know. But uh, you asked me to explain what a ninja is, okay? A, a ninja, if you know what an athlete is, an athlete is a fine-tuned individual who has several traits. First of all, he is, has an ability. Second of all, he has uh, an endurance, okay? Which is very, very, very important. And third is, is his conditioning. When you get a ninja, a real ninja, such as this gentleman is up in the ring, and I've seen him before, you're talking about a fine-tuned machine, not an athlete, but a machine. He works like a machine. They're, they're trained in, a, in an undisclosed part of Japan. They're very, very versatile in the martial arts, as well as all kubu jitsu, which is the weapons, taiju jitsu, which is the aspect of all the self-defensive martial arts, as well as the, I, I'm sure he has a wrestling ability as well. Uh, probably a very devastating individual, and you're probably going to see something you've never seen before in this area, for sure. Well, that, I think, is a very, very clear uh, uh, indication of what's upcoming for us. Ron, I understand, too, that uh, you've got a chance to go up against the national champion. He's got to answer you within 30 days. I don't know. You know, they say uh, mind over matter. If you don't have no mind, it don't matter. Right now, my mind's somewhere else. I don't know. You know, I've got... I've got a lot of uh, thoughts in my head of where I want to go and what I want to do. I understand I have a contract. Uh, we're just going to have to see. I've been training for it. Well, okay. <laughs> if you're a little confused, uh, I am too, but that's all right. My thanks to Ron Slinker for being with us here on the opening of the program. And now we are going to be seeing uh, the Ninja in action, I believe. Are we going to pause first for a commercial? There we are. Okay, we're gonna no, we're gonna introduce the match first. All right, let's go to our ring announcer. This, is this match is one fall with a 10-minute time limit. Introducing first from the deepest part of the Orient, weighing in at 230 pounds, the Ninja, and his opponent hails from Hawaii, weighing in at 245 pounds. Here he is, Prince E. Alkea. One fall with a 10-minute time limit. We'll be back with this match with the Ninja in just a moment. There's the bell, the Prince Aokea moving out against the Ninja. One fall, 10 minute time limit. The Ninja, of course, from Japan. Aokea from uh, the island of Hawaii, second generation competitor. Very quickly, the Prince has the Ninja up against the ring ropes. It was a good clean break. And he... seldom used in, the, in America. Very good move. Oh, reverse twist and kick to the head. This man is very agile. He's a huge man. He's very agile. He's showing some beautiful techniques. His timing's unbelievable. Spinning crescent kick to the side of the head is a hard thing to throw, especially when someone has your other leg. He came right off the ground over six foot and caught the man inside the head. Once again, they lock up collar and elbow back to American catches catch can wrestling, and uh, it's the ninja catching him with a good shoulder smash coming off the ropes, ninja up and over his man. And that time, the prince drove that knee in there, buddy. You know, so far, I am really impressed with the ninja, Walt. 
Looks like the frenzy has dropped him right on his head. But, you know, this is the second time that I have seen the ninja in action. And the first time I was impressed, and right now I'm impressed. This man really seems to know the professional wrestling as well as the martial arts. And when all of this is incorporated together, that makes this man a very dangerous adversary. You, you don't know what to expect from a man like this, if he's going to do the martial arts or if he's going to be wrestling. Excellent point. And I might point out, Ron Slinker talked about the conditioning of the athlete. And uh, this ninja looks to be as finely honed as an athlete as I've ever seen. Wow! Into a drop kick. Man, it's fantastic. What timing. What timing. You don't see that often. Uh, the, the ninjas move very fast off of ropes and stuff, but he did right in the middle center of the ring without using, utilizing the, the ring ropes at all. Uh, very difficult move. The, the ninja is just as agile as can be. If, and he's a, a large ninja. He's not a small ninja, as you can well see. He's, He's in excess of six foot, well over 200 pounds, well conditioned. He's a keeper. Throwing a reverse back kick. Just let the man know that he's all right. Side headlock and the ninja comes out of that into a top wrist lock. Good reversal by Prince Iokea. And let's not sell the Prince short either. This is a beautiful drop toe hold uh, from behind, well executed, and the ninja. Maybe having a little problem here. Well, Prince Okea is a very well-conditioned athlete. He's been around wrestling for a while. His father was a professional wrestler, one of the greatest in the world. And the Prince is following in his footsteps. But right now, it looks like the Ninja is having his share of difficulty. So the Prince will have to stay right on top of him, not give him any court at all, because you give the Ninja an inch, I tell you, he's going to take a mile because the guy is... His agility is just unbelievable, the way he moves around the ring. But he has been slowed down a lot right now. Well, there, uh, the Prince has him in a pretty good position. It's going to take a lot for the Ninja to come out of this one, Ron. Uh, absolutely. You know, you can't take nothing away from him. Professional wrestling, undoubtedly, is the strongest professional sport there is around. And uh, you don't find any tougher person than you find in professional wrestling. There's no doubt about it. That's why I'm involved in it now. Full arm drag and twist now by uh, Prince Alkea. Okay, of course, uh, he said earlier, second generation wrestler, the famed King Curtis, chairman of the board, and the high knee lift that has the ninja somewhat stunned. Forearm across the uh, middle of the back, and uh, Iokea tried to set him up. High vertical suplex by Iokea. And uh, Iokea began to take, tried to use his head as a battering ram. The ninja rolled to one side. The ninja back to his feet. He's utilizing a lot of wrestling techniques, which indicates he has been trained somewhere in wrestling. Beautiful technique. Well, you know, Gordon, I don't know what you call that move there, but it was quite effective, whatever it's called. Well, it has Iokea befuddled, and Iokea outside the ring now. Right. Beautiful. Right over the top rope. Plus body block coming right off the ropes. Iokea coming up very slowly. Iokea moving up very, very slowly. The ninja's got his stuff together now. He's coming back to, a, to where he's got total control of what he's doing. And, ooh, beautiful. Back to wow. the top of the see it again complete reverse somersault coming back down across his man hooks the far leg the inverted lateral press and referee bill alfonso you've seen it the first moonsault in professional wrestling all right but anyway can't go back rechange that two great athletes both still doing well both successful but now <laughs> you're going to see two legendary guys that need no introduction dusty Rhodes versus Harley Race um, at the Bayfront Center in St. Petersburg. The Bayfront Center back in the early 70s was like the mecca of wrestling in Florida. Uh, it was a beautiful brand new building set, 8,000 people. The first event in it was wrestling. 
up until probably 1993 or 4, the three largest crowds ever in the Bayfront Center were all three wrestling events. The main event of the number one largest crowd was Jack Briscoe versus Dory Funk Jr. Number two was Dusty Rhodes versus Terry Funk. Number three was Mike Graham versus Harley Race as the main event on the shows. Um, great matches, great stuff. But anyway, you're going to see Dusty Rhodes and Harley Race in a lumberjack match. And in this match, you're going to see Sonny King, Eric the Red, names of the past that have been forgotten. But once you see them, you're going to remember and go, wow, I know those guys. Unfortunately, Eric's not with us anymore. He lost his life in Tampa coming home from Miami one night and unfortunately Steve Kerr and I wrestled him the night that, that he died but won't go there anyway this is about fun it's about history you're gonna learn about wrestling and the wrestlers and things that happened and stuff that you've never heard before so right now let's go to Dusty Rhodes versus Harley Race and you're gonna see a locker room interview from Dusty Rhodes that's never been seen before a lot of the stuff that you see on these shows have never ever been seen before. So let's go right now. Dusty Rhodes, Harley Race, Bayfront Center, Legends of Wrestling, interviews you've never seen. Two special bulletins at this time before we bring you the action in this uh, film of the World Heavyweight Championship. Steve Kern, who had his leg broken by uh, Sonny King, Pax Long, and Eric the Red, has undergone corrective surgery for the damaged tendons. Uh, in his foot and ankle and is currently recuperating at the Florida Hospital in Orlando. And the president of the NWA, Mr. Bob Geigel, has ordered that this film, immediately after this airing here on Championship Wrestling, be sent directly to the board of directors of the National Wrestling Alliance. They want to scrutinize the film carefully and interrogate all of the uh, principals involved regarding this highly controversial World Heavyweight Championship match. Here you see the match underway. Harley raced the world champion with a salto, and it's the uh, Dusty Rhodes firing back at him. Now, as you can see, the ring is surrounded by lumberjacks. This is a, under lumberjack rules, for the 90 minute time limit. The champion outside the ring being pushed back into the ring by Wahoo McDaniels, Jerry Briscoe, Rocky Johnson. The world heavyweight champion Harley Race on the canvas. Dusty Rhodes coming off the ropes. There you see another of the lumberjacks. Ollie Bay uh, to the right. Pete Austin. Also Mr. Sato and Mr. Saito and Bob Duncan. You can see them all uh, putting the champion back into the ring in this most important world heavyweight championship match. A highly controversial situation as you'll see in just a couple of moments. I might point out there you see Pac Song and Sonny King, two more of the Lumberjacks. Of course, there were several standby uh, uh, Lumberjacks, including uh, Eric the Red. Uh, Dusty Rhodes catches the world champion on that second rope, slams him into the center of the ring. Dusty Rhodes continues to punish the world heavyweight champion. The title that he has sought for such a long, long time uh, could perhaps be within his reach at this point in time. Sonny King watching one of the lumberjacks. There's Pac Song, the champion, coming off the ropes now, and Dusty Rhodes ducks out of the way. Rhodes in with a lateral press. Holly Bay pointing out the fact that the world heavyweight champion's feet are on the ropes. And so consequently, the hold is broken. Back on their feet, it is uh, the world champion bringing Rhodes up into a souffle. Rhodes on the canvas. Rhodes coming up slowly, coming back into the ring now. And you can see Ali Bay over to one side. And a problem erupting now with Sonny King. Ali Bay hitting Rhodes from the outside. Dusty Rhodes running Ali Bay into the uh, steel post. The guardrail outside the ring. Ali Bay is down. You see them administering aid to him at this time. And Dusty Rhodes has already been uh, lacerated, as has the champion. The two of them battling it out now in the squared circle. Uh, there you see them uh, rendering more assistance to Ali Bay. He too has been injured, and it appears that Ali Bay is going to be escorted from the ring. Drop kick by the challenger, Dusty Rhodes, puts the champion on the canvas once again. Ali Bay being removed, and of course, one of the standby lumberjacks will be uh, moving up to the ring area. This is a 90 minute time limit. Lumberjack rules. Dusty Rhodes now moves in on the champion once again. Ali Bay being escorted from the ring area. Dusty Rhodes again has the champion in dire straits. Rhodes looking to the thousands jammed at the Bayfront Center in St. Petersburg. And now the spinning toe hold on the world heavyweight champion. The referee checking. Rhodes knocked to one side by the champion. Rhodes to the other side of the ring and the uh, referee has been knocked from the ring. The referee is knocked from the ring. Rhodes is outside the ring. 
There's uh, Mr. Saito, and now the champion tries to set Rhodes for a pile driver, but watch Rhodes offending the champion, backdrops him. Dusty Rhodes turned around. The referee still out of action, still out of commission now. Dusty Rhodes brings the world heavyweight champion Harley Race up. A full pile driver outside the ring. Rhodes against that steel guardrail. Now Dusty Rhodes, the challenger, moves back inside the ring. The referee being helped back in by the, uh, the lumberjacks. Dusty Rhodes telling that the champion is outside the ring on the opposite side. The referee, dazed, gets to his feet, going over to check. And now watch to the left of your screen. There comes Eric the Red coming into the ring. Eric the Red coming into the ring. And Dusty Rhodes dispatching him very, very quickly. And now watch. Sonny King goes over, picks up the uh, object that uh, Eric the Red had and catches Dusty Rhodes in the back of the head. And the champion being pushed back in. You'll note now that the champion could not have been aware of this. The referee was not aware of it. Rhodes on the canvas, the champion, with a lateral press, a count of three. Wahoo McDaniels trying to explain that Sonny King and Eric the Red interfered. Uh, the referee obviously did not see it. I cannot believe that the champion was aware of it. But nonetheless, the fatal count of three. And for the moment, that holds. For the moment, that holds. And Harley Race does retain his World Heavyweight Championship. But this film in its entirety uh, will be viewed by the board of directors of the NWA. And Dusty Rhodes had these comments in the dressing room right after this controversial match. You can see I want this time. I took this time. You see the cameras here? You were my personal guest me just a few minutes ago. Holy Race, whatever you feel about this thing, whatever has come between me and you, whether it's your world title shots or not, right now I don't care. But if the NWA can let happen what just happened, what just went on, then I want nothing to do with it. I just want to get bad about it. And Sonny King, what business do you have in my business after I've been here years and two or three years trying so hard to fulfill my dream? And ask the Red, what you running in on my thing for? Ask the Red, go get you. And Sonny King, it was seen before a thousand people. So here we go from here, I don't know. You're in my dressing room, you're right in this place, right here. It's your life. Bob Gallo, you better get your stuff together. And Holly Race, if I ever see you again, I'm going to tell you apart, you understand? I done beat you so many times, I made me sick in my stomach. Sonny King gonna pay, and the Lord gonna pay. And Holly Race, if you still believe you're world champion after this mess that just went on, then I hope your wife don't run me out of your house. That's what I hope. <laughs> I want to take a moment right now to talk to Dusty Rhodes regarding the situation that occurred at the Bayfront Center. And, uh, uh, well, Dusty, you and I looked at the film on this entire situation. We've talked about it at length. And, uh, of course, there's a good possibility this man Eric Red's going to be suspended. Well, God, and I don't, I don't want to you. Hunter Race, if you want to be world's champion, that way. After all, all the sweat and blood I put into it, if you want to be world champion, that way, with the bounty, with Eric the Red, and Sonny King, and Pac Sal, and that whole mess, then take it. And don't bother about it no more. Understand? I've had my gut feel of it. Eric the Red, no suspension. If it's a fine, I'll pay to them. Son of King, smooth talking. Bring it down. You know this thing, Tuesday night, lights out. After it's all over. After my man, Wahoo McDaniel, beats the so-called champion, Holly Race, gutless. Then Eric the Red, 
me and you going to settle this thing because before they loved me, I was as bad as you can get. And from now on, this day on, whether you like it or not, I'm going to get meaner and better than you ever seen. And Eric Durant and Sonny King. Sonny King is just a star. And that's all I got to say about it. Well, may I just say that uh, Eric the Red will answer that call for a lights out match. It has been added. It will follow the World Heavyweight Championship match this coming Tuesday night. And uh, Sonny King's army, if you will, may be depleted by one very, very short order this coming Tuesday night. Dusty Rhodes now facing Eric the Red Tuesday night at the armory in a lights out match. No NWA sanction. Doesn't make any difference as far as the NWA is concerned, and that's the way Dusty wants it. Sonny King, Eric the Red, and uh, Pac Song has some interesting comments that were made previous to this. Okay, let's talk about it now, Blue Eyes So. I'm not interested in Harley Race and his business or anybody else. My business is my business. You took it on your own to violate my rules. I said I come to Florida. I said I want you people to get permission from me. What move you make next? You went over my head. You went to race. So whatever happened to you, happened to you. We couldn't possibly care less about the NWA or anybody else. My rules are my rules. You're gonna, you and everybody else in here is going to go by what I said. And I want to tell you one thing too, Daddy. It's up front. It's got to be a light out match for a simple reason. Why? Because my rule have to apply and the NWA is, doesn't agree with it. So now it's going to be our way. Get tough and let's see, let's see exactly what happened. Okay, now. Back over to you, Mr. Cox. You once and for all, we're going to go around one time again. This time we got Cox. Next time we're going to get Alex. Then we'll see your safety valve. I want to take a moment now to talk to Killer Carl Cox and Wahoo McDaniels. First of all, Mr. Cox, Sonny King says one more time and that's it. One more time, that's it. I think that's all Sonny King is wanting one more time. I think Pac Sons only wants one more time. This is Sonny King. Let me tell you something. I have been up before these fish face people once before, and I have survived it. I think I will survive this one more time, so you say. Just bring him on. Let him do his best. You people know how nuts I am. You know how goofy I am. When I get hurt, I just flip off and just a little bit tired, and I am not responsible. And keep your mouth shut about Alex. I don't hear another thing said about Alex. Well, we very little time remaining, but you do have a chance against the world champion. That's right. There's no doubt that Holly Race is probably the finest wrestling machine in the world today. He's proven that fact. He's spent 18 years defending that title, and he thinks he is the best. Well, let me tell you something, Holly. I spent 18 years wrestling, and at one time I would have said football is my best. But now wrestling is my best, and I'll tell you one thing. It's like a runaway locomotive. Nobody's been able to stop him. This little Indian boy is going to stop you, and I'm going to become the National Wrestling Alliance Heavyweight Champion. We'll find out Tuesday night. After a match has been added this coming Tuesday night, 8.30 at the Armory in Tampa, Dusty Rhodes going up against Eric the Red in a lights-out match, no NWA sanction outside the regulations completely. Let's give a rundown of all of the matches upcoming Tuesday night. Pete Austin takes on Rick Oliver, then it'll be uh, uh, Ollie Bay against Prince Tonga. Jimmy Garvin wrestles against Bob Duncan. Rocky Johnson and Jerry Briscoe will be tag team partners against Mr. Sato and Mr. Saito. Pac Song takes on Killer Carl Cox. And then the NWA World Heavyweight Champion Harley Race defends his title against the challenge of Wahoo McDaniels. And then, after that match is over, a match outside the sanction of the NWA, a lights-out match. Dusty Rhodes settling the score with the bounty hunter Eric the Red, managed by Sonny King. It all takes place this coming Tuesday night, 8.30 at the Armory in Tampa. And don't forget the big fall wrestling spectacular upcoming Monday night, November 6th at 7 p.m. in the Lakeland Civic Center, the beginning of the fabulous Lakeland Stampede. Hey, welcome back. And uh, we try to give you a wide variety of, of matches and stars and young stars and old stars and people that you've seen and heard. And this next, the next thing you're going to see is, doesn't really happen in, in wrestling too much. You're going to see Kendo Nagasaki, great wrestler from Japan. And like I explained earlier how the Japanese connection was made here in Florida, 
He trained here. He worked here for a long time. Wrestling against Kendall Wyndham. Kendall Wyndham being the younger brother of Barry Wyndham, the son of Black Jack Mulligan. Legendary people in the wrestling business. Big Jack was tough and known everywhere. Uh, Barry Wyndham, the Widowmaker at the WWF. Barry is, is still here in Florida and wrestling and, and uh, has a very successful company and a wife and two great kids and he's doing very good. But these are people that, that have history in the wrestling business. Kendo Nagasaki managed by Sir Oliver Humperdinck. Sir Oliver Humperdinck in Florida had the longest run as a manager for the bad guys, as a manager for the villains, as, as anybody that's ever been here. Uh, he just, he could see somebody with potential and he took advantage of it, you know, and he did very, very good. But you're going to see Kendo Wyndham and Kendo Nagasaki with boxing gloves on in an incredible fist fight. And we have it on tape right here. So let's get to it. Now we had mentioned we have a special treat for you, and this had to do with a uh, particular match with Kendall Wyndham against Kendo Nagasaki. If we can, let's take a look at this right now. Uh, it involves, as I said, uh, Kendall Wyndham, and here it is, a boxing match, and uh, joining me also at the desk is Kendall Wyndham. Kendall, as you can see right now, taking a couple of licks uh, from Kendo Nagasaki. This was a match again where uh, maybe I could talk over a little better. Uh, Kendall Nagasaki agreed to a, uh, kind of a full contact karate match with the boxing gloves, but the kicking and elbows, back fists, and all that sort of thing were legal. These are the kind of gloves they use in that match. And uh, this match had been going on for some time. Kendall was using basically a boxing style that was giving Kendall Nagasaki all he could handle. I mean, turn into, you can see it here. He's yeah, pounding, he, him, pounding him good in the corner. A lot of combinations there with the uh, left and the right. Well, look at Kendo. He's uh, he's he, not uh, charging aggressively out of that corner, I guess you could say. And uh, he's, he gained a lot of respect. Uh, the, the hands of the master are trained with the chopping edge of the fist and the knuckles. Uh, All the feet, it, as you see right there. Well, as long as Kendall, Kendall Wyndham could avoid those feet, uh, he had a, a real good, uh, again, I think better hand work in terms of the, with the, with the gloves on. Uh, those hands aren't hardened, soaked in brine, and chopped, uh, again, the, the uh, karate mentality of uh, Kendo Nagasaki, a lot of uh, hand work, chopping blocks, toughening up the hands. He is deadly with them, but in the gloves, this was, because uh, Kendall wouldn't go into this kind of match, I don't think, unless he had an idea of going to a karate match. He was willing to take a chance. Now again, here, watch this. He's just pounding him into a pudding. And uh, Kendo Nagasaki is obviously a very, you can see him holding his jaw there. He looks well, he's he's, looking like a loser, and he's also looking kind of frustrated there. Yeah, he's been seeing uh, up close and personal like the uh, tips of the boxing gloves of uh, Kendall too often. Uh, he's backing up now. He's very worried. And as this match goes on, you'll see it, it becomes even worse for Kendo Nagasaki. Uh, Kendo takes a couple, but Kendo's not a boxer per se. He's a chopper and a thruster. And here he's just opening up with a ground. Oh, he gave it. left hook there. You okay. can see, there's, there's his left, right, left, right, left. Kendo with that left-handed style is a different, has a different approach. Again, coming from the left side. And that left hook is the same thing as a right, or left cross, I guess you say, is the same thing as a right cross. And he's not Kendo Nagasaki down again. At this point, Kendo Nagasaki is trying to go for that Kendo stick. But with the box, you can see it laying over in the corner, but with the boxing gloves, he couldn't get it on. He couldn't get the, uh, the pick up the stick, so he took off the gloves. That's where the match, he was disqualified here. But you can see he could not handle, in his kind of match, his full contact karate, he could not handle Kendall Wyndham. And uh, he had to pull the gloves off and, uh, again, go for the go for that kendo stick. And, uh, well, it just once again shows that uh, the shock troops, along with Sir Oliver Humperdinck, in their mind, they're going to do whatever it takes to beat Kendall Wyndham or anyone, for that matter, and that's exactly what they did. Well, Kendall's here to join us. Kendall, you got a couple words to he's say. Got his, he's got his breath back. Uh, what kind of comments do you have to say about that particular match? Well, Mr. Root, Mr. 
Rhodes, you know, I wouldn't have even touched Humperdinck, but he inter inter interfered into a match. I proved right there that I think that I can beat Kendo Nagasaki. And Ron Bass, I just want to tell you, you interfered in a match. And wherever I get you, I guarantee you I'm going to knock you out. Same goes for you, Kendo Nagasaki. Put your dukes up, put your dukes up. Me, I was never one for boxing gloves. I was too short, my arms were too, couldn't reach out and hit anybody. I just used to leg dive and take them down and then figure it out from there. But anyway, we're going to go now from a, a boxing match with wrestlers that is, was very unheard of to a segment uh, that is very close to me, Hiro Matsuda. Uh, Hiro was probably, he was the world's light heavyweight champion, probably one of the toughest wrestlers to ever come out of Japan, and uh, one of the best coaches of professional wrestlers in history. I mean, going back to myself, Steve Kern, Austin Idol, uh, Dennis McCord, same guy, Paul Warndorf, Brian Blair, Barry Windham, Kendall Windham, Dustin Rhodes, Lex Luger, Hulk Hogan, I mean just on and on and on. The names of wrestlers that, that Hiro Matsuda trained and the lives he touched was unbelievable. And it wasn't easy to get to get in to work out with Hiro Matsuda. It would be like saying, oh gee, I think I want to play football. I'm going to go try out with the Minnesota Vikings. Well, unless you have credentials, unless you have a, a sponsor, someone saying, yes, I know his ability, yes, I know what he's done, you could get in to work out with Hiro Matsuda, but you're going to see Ron Simmons, who was up for the Heisman Trophy at Florida State University, incredible athlete, still wrestling today. Ron Simmons is Farouk at the WWF. You're going to see him before he ever had a match. You're going to see the first time Ron Simmons was ever on television with Dewey Forte, who was also a football player that was Ron Simmons' friend. And Ron had people from Tampa vouch for who he did. He brought in his credentials. He brought in all the newspaper things about the Heisman Trophy, about everything he had done in football, and uh, even had the coach from Florida State University call my dad and, and put in a good word to get him in to train with Hiro Matsuda. But anyway, you're going to see right now Ron Simmons' first seen on television and it's just training exercising with the great wrestling coach Hiro Matsuda so let's go to it and welcome back well last week on our show we happened to introduce to you a couple of gentlemen who are going to be quite uh, quite a figure that are going to play very important roles here in wrestling down the road Dewey Forte and Ron Simmons last week you have to get a chance to see them working out to actually putting all the iron to work over at the University of Tampa well we have a special treat for you now in the evolution of being trained into uh, professional wrestling and that uh, involves uh, some specific training uh, very close and inside of the ring let's take a look at some of this right now with uh, Dewey Forte on the uh, left I believe and Ron Simmons on the right with uh, there's the mentor Hiro Matsuda there he is he's still he's still doing these things himself Again, I went through this training about 18 years ago, and I I don't remember it with any fondness, except I do remember how much good it did me when I actually got in the ring. And Ron Simmons, again, he's been, both these men have played professional football, and they've confided to me that they didn't have to do any kind, this kind of exercise at all. And they were, it, it was just a different style. They worked out real hard in the weight room and running, of course. But wrestle, wrestling uh, requires a different kind of a style, a different kind of a discipline, different, different physical uh, Different kinds of agility that uh, you would not necessarily need or use on the uh, gridiron, but in the uh, squared circle, you just never know what kind of uh, repertoire you're going to need uh, for an opponent. And these also, these are endurance exercises. Uh, you, you stay at them here in Matsuda is in rep rep repetitions of a hundred of these, a hundred of those, two hundred of that, to where uh, he might have these men. We're just seeing short segments here. Uh, I witnessed one of these workouts. He had, they did this exercise for upwards of five minutes. You can see the sweat popping off on them. Sure can. And uh, that, well, you can see the mat right there. They've been doing this probably at this time about four or five minutes. You can see that the mat's wet between them. These guys have really, uh, again, Ron and Dewey both have shown a lot of uh, discipline. Uh, they come to these workouts, and believe me, it's not fun. They come with a smile on their face because they know they're going to get something out of it. 
And that's the kind of uh, the mental attitude is very important at going to any enterprise, but going into professional wrestling. Uh, you not only need to be tough, uh, you need to be optimistic too. Uh, it helps to be uh, the aggressive wrestlers you see, the ones that start out with a bang like Lex Luger, he came with a real positive attitude. And part of that attitude was because he was trained so well. He knew he was ready. And uh, he's uh, talked to these young men himself, uh, Ron Simmons and him, colleagues, uh, Dewey uh, Forte. Uh, ex-pro football player, uh, they have a bond between them from their, their similarity and backgrounds. He's talked to them and stressed to them how important it is to get this kind of training, to come in, be physically fit and mentally fit, so when you actually get in the ring, you see the men up, striking that neck. And believe me, if the men aren't used to this kind of exercise, now you're talking about a 280-pound man with all his weight up on top of his head, strengthening that neck. Well, this is something that you, or, well, particularly myself, not necessarily you, I would not want to try at home. Look at this particular move on the neck. Not just his own weight, but the 225 pounds of Hiro Matsuda on top of him, too. Again, you talk about strength. Here's another neck strengthener. The man on top is doing sit-ups. The man underneath is helping pushing him up with his neck, doing resistance exercises with that neck. You can see the strain he's putting on Dewey Forte. Again, the sweat coming off those men. This is a basic wrestling technique that's, in, in order to protect yourself in a, in a tie-up with somebody, you try to stay on the inside. Uh, if you're on the outside, a man can grab you for a bear hug and hip throw. And uh, Hiro Matsuda was demonstrating with Ron Simmons. Now Dewey and Ron, again, it's just a basic inside-out technique. Here, now this is mental toughness. Gentlemen, are your abdomens in condition? Let's find out. Let's find out. You can see Dewey might looks like he's not sure. Hero's saying, keep those hands down. Let's see. <laughs> I can understand. No doubt about that. <laughs> Can you imagine? I, I can't even imagine standing there, even with the right mental attitude and taking a two by four in the stomach, but I can understand where and how it plays an important role. No doubt about that well, at These all. men are going to be ready. They look like they're halfway there now. I think the, you people in the wrestling, whether, no matter what part of the country you're in watching this program, you're going to be really impressed when you see, see these young men for the first time. Stan Rhodes along with Bob Rube. Bob, uh, it hasn't been that long ago we uh, saw these two gentlemen you are about to see, Dewey Forte and, Bo and uh, Ron Simmons, working out with weights. Last week we got an opportunity to see them getting that training inside of the ring. And uh, I guess it's kind of the evolution of becoming a professional wrestler. This week we're going to see a little bit different kind of a workout. Well, again, uh, these guys, uh, it's a real thrill for me to watch these young men about to start into professional wrestling. And I, I predict great careers for both of them. And uh, we're in here in the beginning. And uh, you know, years from now, I think we're going to be able to look back at this and, uh, again, feel in a sense privileged to witness these young men as they're about to get started. Again, more of their training. Why don't we take a look at this? Let's Dan? do that. Uh, both men, excellent athletes, uh, former football players, and uh, tremendous athletes in their own right. Last week, uh, many of you got an opportunity to see some of the training that took place within the ring. A uh, particular incident, Bob, uh, I happened to kind of feel it in the stomach seeing the 2 by 4 being applied to the abdominal area. And well, it's just kind of training, Stan. Uh, here, Ryan Simmons showing some of his football drills. It's called a grab drill. You see the agility of these big men, both up around the 300 mark, uh, being able to uh, move with that speed and agility. These are tactics that will help them in professional wrestling, uh, be able to move around a man, go behind him, uh, that quickness. Here, uh, Hiro Matsuda trains men uh, physically and mentally, but not just with hard, grueling workouts, also this kind of thing, uh, a little bit of uh, what some people would call just playing, but uh, he, they do this for several hours where they, they ran uh, about five miles. Then he let them uh, take a break on basketball court, shooting, uh, shooting some hoops. And uh, again, these guys, uh, both of them have not uh, wavered one bit from the training. They haven't backed up a bit. They've been here uh, for the training. They come and give a hundred, given a hundred percent effort. Got a smile on their face. And I will, like I say, I went through it years ago myself. I couldn't do it now. My, uh, you know, as a young man, I could take it, but. So I know what these guys are going through, and uh, Stan has done a lot of uh, response to uh, their appearances on the television program. That there has. Uh, from Ron Simmons' uh, base in Tallahassee at Florida State, uh, 
newspaper uh, editors or reporters are calling and interviews with the guy and uh, uh, all the folks around uh, Lakeland, uh, Kathleen High School are uh, well thrilled about Dewey Forte's progress, uh, the folks at Tim Cookman College uh, have called and expressed an interest in personal appearances. We're glad to have more of their native voice songs back in the area. And uh, again, for you wrestling fans out there, you can look for a lot. When you see these young men in the near future, I guarantee you, they're going to hit the wrestling world with a real explosion. Well, these are two names you folks need to remember, Dewey Forte and Ron Simmons. You're going to be hearing more about them. Hey, I'm proud to say that I was a student of Hiro Matsuda from the time I was in high school through my wrestling career. Fortunately, he never beat me with a 2 by 4 I don't know if I could have taken that, but he had different means of training and everything, and that's just the way it was. Through this show, you're going to hear noises, and you're going to hear stuff going on, because this is the corporate headquarters for Championship Wrestling from Florida. Wouldn't you like to go to work every day in this surroundings? So sometimes it gets a little noisy, sometimes you hear something, but what better attitude, what better atmosphere to work in? Right now, we're going to see another great legend in professional wrestling, Barry Windham. Barry, the son of Blackjack Mulligan, brother of Kendall Windham, who you saw earlier in the boxing match, just had an incredible career. Uh, he and, and Ron Bass, Ron was from Texas also, and I guess those Texas guys always just had to deal with each other. If you were from a different city, or you could even be from the same city in a different neighborhood, and they were always trying to show who was the best. Well, you're going to see a blood battle for the Southern Heavyweight Championship between Kendall, I mean, excuse me, Barry Windham, Kendall Windham's brother, and Ron Bass. Barry was fairly young in his career. Ron Bass was nearing his end. Ron was fighting to keep his job. Barry was fighting to build his reputation. You're going to see the outcome right now. Yeah, right now, here's Cowboy Ron Bass walking over here very proudly. I knew it wouldn't take a long time. How are you doing this morning, Mr. Ron? Very good, Cowboy. <laughs> what's, what's the particular situation here? What do you mean, what situation? Hey, wait a minute. Where are you going, man? I'll be back there in just a minute. You need to go on back there and wait for me. You understand? Well, lo and behold, the Cowboy Ron Bass is chagrin. The Falcon did not stay in the dressing room and uh, walked out. What are you... Uh, what do you make of that? Well, you know, it's like an eagle, you know. The, he, he, the man calls himself Falcon at times when the little eaglets, they start, you know, you put them in a the nest, they kind of want to get out and they want to fall out and fly out of the nest every now and then. The man will be back, so don't worry about it, Mr. Rhodes. Don't worry about it one little bit. What I want to talk about is something that's near and dear to my heart, and you're looking at it right here, the Florida Heavyweight Championship. Something that the big cowboy earned, something that the big cowboy deserved, and something that the big cowboy is going to keep for a long, long time, brother. Well, Ron, we wanted to uh, ask you, uh, we have a, a videotape of how you won the belt. You're finally going to show it? Yes. Huh? You're all... finally going to show my great victory? Well, man, that's great. Let's look at it. We'd like your commentary. Hey, hey, I don't love it. nothing about, all about my victories, brother. If you will, let's, show let's roll yeah. that vi videotape right now. And, uh, Cowboy, uh, you can do your own play-by-play. -play. <laughs> hey, great. Just look at the big Cowboy, brother. You know, I heard the ring look like it was getting kind of disrepaired, and I figured it was time for the big Cowboy to kind of straighten things around. Right there. in the middle of a match, you decided to do yes, a little Yes, you know, Barry Wendell had been over and messed with that turnbuckle all night long. He'd been doing something, trying to take unfair advantage, which is usual the Wyndham family. But see, the big cowboy had it planned all along. He says, Wyndham, if you get over and get to messing with it, I guarantee you I'm going to turn around to my advantage. And that's exactly what I do. Well, it Mr. looks like Rose. as if right now you're doing the repair work. What we saw before I was just finished at the first stand road. You saw me getting it started, and then I seen my opponent getting up, and I said, hey, i got to take care of this situation before it gets out of hand. And that's exactly what I did. I took care of the situation before it got out of hand, and you know, but the end result, it doesn't matter what you think, what Bob Roof thinks, what Southern Championship Wrestling thinks, the end result is Big Cowboy is the Florida champion, and he's going to be that way for a long time. But you know, the only thing I like about watching these matches is enjoying a victory over the Wyndham's, whether it's Kendall Wyndham, whether it's Barry Wyndham, or whether it's the old man, Blackjack Mulligan, I like beating Wyndham's. I like beating windows, brother. And I tell you what, when I get the opportunity, oh, it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up when I get in the same room with a window, brother. Well, Ron Bass, uh, you had a, a title defense against Barry Windham, and I wonder if you would mind commentating on uh, your actions in this oh, particular oh, match. Oh, I love that, too. Let's bring it on, brother. Let's take a look at this particular situation right now. See right there, now you're going to say anything about the legal 
moves that Barry Windham is using, you're going to stand there and tell me that a closed fist or a punch to the face is a legal maneuver. You didn't say nothing about that. You says, go get him, Barry. Well, Barry Windham uh, is lacerated here. How did that happen? He fall you know, down? He's a, he's a real clumsy man. You know, he's about six foot six. He's real gangly, you know, and he, he kind of strips over a pencil if it's laying on the, on the floor or anything. And that's probably exactly what happened, Bob Ruth. He probably stepped on either a paper cup or something, probably fell and busted that skinny, ugly face of his. So don't come out here and blame me. You've got no proof whatsoever that I did anything that caused any damage to Barry Wendell. Well, would you say at this point that uh, he's got you on the rope, so to speak? Yes, he does. You know, I've never at one time come out here and told you that the Wyndhams do not have wrestling ability, that the Wyndhams do not have guts, that the Wyndhams cannot take care of themselves. I've never one time told you that. What I have told you is the big cowboy can go out there and stand hold a toe with him, and that's what I do every time I get an opportunity. Well, it doesn't look like you're standing toe-to-toe -to -toe at this particular measure. Oh, you Thank like you're taking stand, shots man. right now at uh, at wind, and now you're flat you're on your back. You're right there, another illegal move, a blow to the face. But you think that's fine and dandy? You saw exactly how my face got busted wide open. Barry Wyndham using an illegal power, uh, power driver right here. You can break a man's neck, you can snap it like a twig. But does that put the big cowboy out? No, sir. I'm going to take a lick and come back kicking bigger and stronger than that'll happen, brother. And that's exactly what happens in this match. So far, it kind of makes me sick down to my stomach. Everybody come out here and they go higher and screaming for these golden fair haired gentlemen. And they never well, say Wait anything. a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. What's, what's this? You're pulling out, out of your tights. Uh, you what is this? Been fighting fire wait a minute. I've done every kind of look at kind of this. Matches, and I'm not going to the ring unprepared. I go to the ring ready for any kind of opponent, any kind of task that's available to me. And if you don't think that I'm going to be thinking I've got one trick on my sleeve every minute, you're sadly, sadly mistaken. Boy, oh boy. Boy, close fist by Barry Windham, and then you pull out the pattern. That's called tick for tick, huh? If you're going to burn me, brother, you better expect well, to get into the kitchen because look, I'm going to burn you back, brother. It does look somewhat like a backfire in that situation. Could I ask you one question, What's please? that? That powder, that's, uh, that's from Kendo Nagasaki's uh, <laughs> stable. Did you uh, perhaps confer with him? Or? No, Ruth, that surprises me that you picked up on some little technicality like that. All I'm going to say is you guessed about it for a long time, because I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> well, you've got another match coming up, another title defense with Barry Windham, and I think that the DQ rule is waived in this particular case, where you can lose that title on a disqualification if you p repeat these same kind of tactics. You're going to lose that title. You know what i got to say about that, Mr. Bob Root? That if it, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. The no disqualification rule is waived. That means that Barry Wyndham cannot use the fist. If he uses the fist, he gets disqualified, and I win the title. So i tell you what, Mr. Barry Wyndham, let's just get it ready, and let's get it on. No disqualification. That is fine with me, brother. Well, there's more in this situation. We're going to be finding out more about that. We've got more action coming your way. Stay with us on Southern Professional Wrestling. Well, I guess it's pretty simple to say that Barry Windham improved his rating and Ron Bass lost a little edge. But you win some, you lose some. That's the way life is. There ain't a horse that's never been rode and there ain't a rider that's never been thrown. You gotta take the good with the bad. But right now, we're gonna go back to 1985. And uh, I had this idea uh, cable television, TBS was the only cable show out at the time, uh, and I went to Channel 44, the station that we were on here, and talked to the program director and said, you have affiliate stations around the country. I want to put a show together. I want to bring the NWA, the AWA. I want to bring stars from all over the United States. Do a show here in Tampa and call it Battle of the Belts, but televise it nationwide. Could you call your affiliate stations around the country get them to block this time off, and we'll do a deal called Battle of the Belts. And the guy, hey man, that's a great idea. Long story short, it happened. Battle of the Belts 1 was the first show. We did three, Battle of the Belts 1, 2, and 3. This first show comes from the Sun Dome in Tampa under a hurricane warning when they had evacuated the city. The building was still full. And you're going to see the AWA World Heavyweight Champions from, from Minneapolis, the Road Warriors, wrestling against Harley Race, don't need to say who he is, and Stan Hansen. Stan started wrestling in Amarillo 
in Dory Funk Sr.'s territory, and I say the word territory, you people today probably have never heard of territories. Years ago, Florida, Georgia, every state was a territory. They had different promoters, they had different titles, they had different champions, and territories were intermingled. But this is the first time a nation of territories came together for one TV show sent around the United States. So let's watch an incredible battle with the Road Warriors against Stan Hansen and Harley Race. This is when Hulkamania was starting, this is when wrestling started booming, and this was the key point of it. We have a very exciting film of the Road Warriors going up against Harley Race and Stan Hansen at Battle of the Belts 1, which was commentated by Gordon Soley and Mike Graham. Let's go to that exciting piece of film now. Five pounds from Chicago, Illinois, accompanied by the manager Paul Herring, the Road Warriors. And we've got a battle going here before they even got to the ring. Stan the man Hansen going absolutely berserk as he crashes out through the crowd and smashes. You've got the hawk and the animal out there, the road warriors. Ellering has been beaten to one side. And now they're up against the retaining wall. The hawk and the animal. And Street fighter going. You better be ready. And of course, Harley Ray, seven times world heavyweight champion. He's no one to take lightly either. Now I've said it about him before, and I'll say it again. Race and fight a buzz song. Give it the first two rounds. And uh, he has just uh, caught it from the hawk, however. The hawk dives into the head of Harley Race. Vertical suplex. Again, you can see the man start to roll to his hands and knees. But obvious, a lot of amateur training, a lot of amateur training when it's embedded in you like that. You never lay on your back. You don't sleep on your back. You never lay on your back doing anything. Every time this man's been dropped on his head, no matter what's been done to him, as soon as he hits the mat, he's rolling for his stomach because you can't get pinned laying on your stomach. Race came down, and you're right. He has hurt his uh, hurt his leg earlier, and it's becoming increasingly obvious he's having a problem maintaining stability on that injured leg. Right there, the big man, the animal, going for a press slam. He's 275 pounds. He's been around a long time. When he was going up, he felt what he was doing, got his weight shifted backwards, got the man off balance, and he was unable to get him that slam. He did have him over his head, 275 pounds extended at length, but Harley was able to block it, drop behind him, and avoid coming down on his back. All right, the hawk in there now. Ellering, I must say this about Ellering. There's a great difference in the way Ellering manages his men as opposed to Percy Pender. Ellering, much calmer. Just as much intensity, I believe, but it's almost by thought process rather than by vocalizing. Ellering paces back and forth, but he is a stern disciplinarian. Now, don't go to Fist City with Harley Racer. You're in a lot of trouble. There's no question about that. A little body slam on the man. Race rolls to one side. The hawk came down on that elbow. Uh-uh. Whoa, man. Both of them over that top rope. Referee hurled to one side, and we've got a pair sixer going on outside the ring. A pair sixer outside the ring, and uh, the referee tolling the count. That's it.